In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this day, for a new week, a new opportunity to dive into your word and to be in community. We pray in a special way, Lord, for peace, healing, comfort for all those who are affected currently by COVID or who are afraid or who are unable to be here because of it. We just pray, Lord, for um, just a speedy conclusion to this long, long season of pandemic and help us to be reminded always that you are good, you are true, that all things work for good for those who love you and that you are with us, um, even in the midst of our worries and anxieties. And so we pray, Lord, for your healing, for your presence and your comfort for us. And we thank you for this opportunity to hear your voice tonight. We pray for all those joining us on Zoom and on YouTube. And we just ask that you would allow your spirit to speak to every single one of us in a unique a way that you've prepared and set forth. You knew we would be here or watching this tonight or whenever we are, and so we just pray, God, that we allow you to speak, to not be distracted or um, preoccupied with any other thoughts, but we would just be fully present here. So we set aside and at your feet anything that is weighing heavily on our hearts, that is busying our minds, and we ask, Lord, that your will would be done during this time and in our lives. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. It's the story of the wedding at Cana. And even though we're in cycle C, and we're usually in the Gospel of Luke during cycle C, we have one little episode here in the Gospel of John, and then we'll be back in Luke for several weeks um, until we reach the season of Lent. So... The reason we're looking at this is because this is the first moment in the Gospel of John of Jesus' public ministry. And so as we're coming out of Advent, Jesus has been baptized. We're starting to get into the season of ordinary time. We start looking at the events of Jesus' ministry uh, in the Sunday Gospels. And so this is one of the first, even though it's outside of the Gospel of Luke, John is sprinkled through all three years. And so we get this scene, uh, this account that only occurs in the Gospel of John. So, we're going to read this twice through, verses 1 through 11 of chapter 2. First time through, paint the picture of what's being said. Uh, pretend you've never heard the story before. Set aside any other image you have. Pay attention to the details. Close your eyes if you want, or just act as though there's a blank canvas in front of you. And pretend you are seeing the scene unfold for the very first time. Place yourself in it. Pay attention to your senses. If you were there, what would you be seeing, smelling, tasting, hearing, feeling, uh, everything that is going on in the scene before you. So first time through, John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then, when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory. And his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So now we're going to read this a second time. Second time through, I invite you to pay attention very closely to the words as they are being said. And as you have that new image in your mind of the scene, see if any particular word or phrase strikes you, or any detail or image from the scene uh, already painted in your mind. But particularly, doesn't need to relate to this passage. Is there a word, a phrase that the Lord is just speaking something into your life, into your mind right now? Sparks a memory, a thought, something that he's using to speak to you in some way. So, it can be anything, seemingly insignificant word, 
But whatever stands out to you, reflect on that, remember it, begin to ask, why this? What is the Lord trying to say to me? Or what might he be compelling me to do? Second time through, John 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it, and when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana in Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So I invite you to take a moment to reflect on the things that stood out to you, uh, why you think they did, as well as any questions that um, arose in your mind as you read this, and take a few moments to think about those to yourself, and then I invite you to share with those at your table uh, what are those things that stood out, questions that you have, things that you noticed? Uh, we'll do that for a few minutes, and then we'll bring it back to the larger group. If you're doing this on Zoom, please feel free to do that in the chat. We'll make sure it gets shared. If you're watching it on YouTube, please do so in the comments so we can uh, respond to you later. But if you're here, please do that for the next few minutes. I think I know what you might say. Probably <laughs> the same thing I would say. Okay, you tell me you said that. Uh, <laughs> not my <laughs> mother. Yes, your mother is like, right? I think it's my mother. I'm not just saying that. No, because I was just saying that. There is a sense of the There is a footnote here. Do you have a footnote that explains that particular area? And we'll yeah, that's why I'm that that is, is, I've, yeah. I've heard talks about the other times in Japan. Mm -hmm. They're saying how uh, Jesus is mm -hmm. like kind of pressing their off, but yeah. Yeah. Like, that Mary yeah. kind of has this authority yeah. over yeah. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. He wasn't mm -hmm. ready to you know, start so his yeah. mission. Yeah. 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 And she kind of just talks off and going to start it off. So it's kind of cool that she went in that direction. So, yeah, so, the also explains how this, your concern is that I like the part that she said, mm -hmm. what is this? It's like, it's 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 I saw this. Sorry, I wrote. I saw this one meme. My humor is broken, but there is this one picture, and it is this bartender saying, "Okay, Jesus, you're cool. He does not water now." And he's like, "Okay." But yeah. What is the jar so, like what does it mean by hour? Has not How does that? Why is that meant to? Oh, I'm just saying. 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 I'
take a few moments to wrap up your discussions and bring any of those uh, reflections, questions up to the large group. Anything have Anyone have anything that stood out to them they want to share? Any questions that they would like to ask? Yeah? I don't want to have the DD feel over here. I wanted to show you. I wanted to ask you a question. Yes. Uh, can I... Uh, yeah, come on up. Yeah. I understand all these notes, obviously. Yes. But there is an asterisk that I don't realize. Yes, yeah, so the asterisk always um, goes toward a footnote. So this one is about here, 2, 1 to 6, 72. So it's referencing this footnote. This one. Or here, yeah. Could be either. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Yes, Lynn. But, but uh, immediately when we notice is on the third page, it says on the third day. Mm -hmm. Because why would they say on the third day? Yeah. That's a really cool detail that I can't wait to blow your minds about. <laughs> you think it might just be simple, like it means on the third day, like the resurrection, but no. I mean, that's one part, but like, you just wait. It's like my favorite thing about the Gospel of John is that phrase right there because of what leads up to it. Yeah. So I'll show you. I'll show you that as we go through. Yeah. Other uh, things stood out. Other questions. What else? Yeah. The six um, stone water jars. Yes. You will probably explain it. Uh, what is that? Yeah. So they're, they're specifying the, the six stone jars. They're there for Jewish ceremonial washing. Specifies that. So there's tons of uh, rituals in the Torah, the first five books of our Bibles, which is the, the Hebrew Torah, that specify when you have to purify or wash. Um, there were certain people like priests um, who had to do that any time um, before they ate or uh, ate the sacrificial offerings. That became more of a common practice that the Pharisees began to enforce, something that Jesus actually criticizes, I think, in Mark chapter 7. Um, but a lot of people would want, like, there wasn't the, where we wash our hands before food. You know, they didn't have any idea about bacteria or things like that. Um, so ceremonial washings always had to do with, like, were you uh, ritually impure for any reason? Do you have to purify yourself or something like that? So we don't necessarily know why they're there. It probably had to do with that kind of scrupulosity about the law where people were now doing it before they ate and after they ate, even though they didn't have to. Um, six, the number six in Scripture always emphasizes something that's incomplete because seven is the complete number. Okay, seven is the heavenly, kind of the covenantal, the complete number. So six is always incomplete. That's why it says in Revelation the number of the beast is 666. It's because it's like the trinity of, of incompleteness. It's like the, the antithesis of 777, which would be like the most divine kind of combination you could get. Um, and it's also a numerological abbreviation for the name of Nero Caesar. Um, if you spell out his name in, in Roman numerals or Roman letters, they all have number significances. Um, or in Greek, I mean. So... Anyway, so six has that significance as well. Um, so that's why they were there. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. What you pointing out that what the 
the six stone jars where it's like I'm and just envisioning it being like dishwater. And it's kind of funny how you mm -hmm. like, give this to your boss, then drink this dishwater. And it's yeah. Just like, what the heck? Right. Yeah. Well, they're not full. They're empty. Then they fill them to the brim. That's a detail. But yeah, the water that would be in there post purification, not good. You know, that's why they're constantly found empty. Is because you don't want it to soak in, and that's why they're made of stone. They're not porous, so you couldn't make ceremonial washing things out of clay or things like that because it would soak in all that like gross purification water. So they're constantly being emptied and purified and things like that. So, yeah, yeah. Alan. Uh, Anna mentioned that um, they wondered about the good wine. Mm -hmm. Serve the the good wine first, then after you will drink, you get the, the poor wine out. Yeah. So is that, I mean, that was the custom of the day. Yeah, it's good party advice, right? You know, just, you know, just fork out for like a couple good bottles, and then people are like, this is great, and then two buck chuck all the way to the rest of the party, you know? Um, yeah, that was the normal custom, because a wedding was a week-long celebration. Yeah, so you were, you were meant to provide food, drink, hospitality, and accommodations for an entire week for everyone you invite to the wedding. It was a huge ceremony, a huge ordeal. I mean, usually in these smaller towns like Cana, Nazareth, um, the whole the whole town was invited. Um, people would come by from nearby as well, relatives and friends and things like that. So, um, yeah, it was expected that you were going to be able to provide. So this running out of wine is a huge faux pas, a huge embarrassing thing to happen. But in order to do that in a cost-effective way, you would save, um, you would serve the good wine first. People are like, this is a great party. And then when they lean into that a little bit, then you can serve them whatever. You know, they probably could have given them the ceremonial water. They wouldn't even recognize it wasn't wine at that point. But, you know, Jesus does something different. So, yeah, that was common practice. Now, something silly that hit me about mm -hmm. the wine is, or the jars, it's like I'm thinking, these are 20 to 30 gallons. It's going to take a while to fill them up mm -hmm. and bring them back, back and forth. Mm -hmm. It just seems something, <laughs> and that's, that's heavy, too. Yeah. Yeah, and there's plenty of parables that Jesus gives about, like, the abundance of God. You know, whenever you see him yield, or about, a, uh, like, a parable that has to do with planting, and a harvest is yielded 30-fold, 50-fold, 100-fold, that's an insane, like, the best harvest you could imagine in like the best possible year might be like 20 or 30 fold. But when Jesus says like a hundred fold, that's like a, like a ridiculous amount more than enough. And the same is true here for the wine, right? He provides in this supernaturally abundant way, not just, just enough, you know, but, and if you think about the, um, the water purification, there's a historian that I think says that, um, one cup of water, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but one cup of water was enough to purify about a hundred people. Because was, there was a simple act of, and you see this in a lot of cultures, um, of kind of ladling water on your hand and it drips down back into the, so you don't absorb very much. Uh, and so if you multiply that, I mean, there's like enough ceremonial, like purification water for like, I don't know, like a quarter of a million people, like a ton of people. Um, and then wine, I mean, people are obviously going to drink more than a cup of wine um, per hundred people, but this is like a, a huge amount. Um, so we'll, we'll, I think we'll talk about why I think that is a little more significant the symbolism of the wine and the, the, the jars and things like that but yeah i love the detail too you know it's it's notes like that like when when the storm happens at sea and jesus is in the boat there's that detail of like jesus was asleep in the boat on a cushion you know it's just like you, someone saw that like they wrote that down like there's six ceremonial jars you know it's not just some guy making up a story like oh there was a jar in the corner or, or you know there's some jar six like just that detail, I think, is important to point out and notice in Scripture as just continued evidence. Like, this is an eyewitness account. Like, someone was there. Like, they saw this. They counted them. Like, this really happened. And those details, I think, they're, I don't think they're silly. I think they're really cool to pick up on. Yeah, Katie. Um, Eric is saying, it's interesting that Jesus' first miracle is associated with a fruit, just like how the fall of Adam and Eve is centered around the fruit from the tree. Also considering that Mary is the second Eve, and she initiates the situation, it also seems to speak to this parallel. Girl, that's my wife. That's right, man. <laughs> exactly. Just switch spots with me. That was, I can't add anything to that at all. That's exactly.
Yeah. It seems like Mary knows what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. Because she tells the waiters to do whatever he says. Yeah. So she seems to, I mean, it seems obvious that she is in on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or at least she knows what he's capable of. Yeah. Which is interesting because his public ministry has not yet began. Right. So we have a little window here into like, I don't know, did he practice miracles for 30 years? You know, kind of like when I was a kid and I wanted to do like magic shows at Christmas parties for my family, practice just for my parents, you know, stuff like that. You know, I mean, Jesus isn't magic, you know, he's supernatural. But, um, you know, she had definitely like a, a complete positive confidence that he was able to do something um, and that he would, you know. Notice he, he it's, it sounds like a scoff. He doesn't scoff her, but it's, it sounds like he's not going to comply. And then Mary just goes and says, do whatever he tells you. Like, she kind of, like, like supersedes him. <laughs> it's just like, he'll do something. So just do whatever he tells you. Typical Jewish mother. I love that. Um, like, just completely confident that her way is going to be borne out. But what I love about this detail is that that phrase, do whatever he tells you, these are Mary's last words in the Gospel of John. She has no other recorded words in the entire Gospel. So the legacy of Mary in this Gospel is do whatever Jesus tells you. Which is very cool. Yeah, Katie. Um, Emily just wanted to share Jesus' conversation with his mother in verse 4 ironically emphasizes his humanity. He mm. performed a miracle, let alone his first one, simply because his mother asked him to. Yeah. And that reminds me of the gospel, maybe it was not from last week, but when he was lost in the temple. And, um, you know, they're saying, why have you done this to us? He says, do you not know I should be in my father's house? But then it says, but he returned home and was obedient to them. And he continues to be obedient to her, um, even though he kind of gives this kind of back and forth. And there's reasons for that. Um, but he's still, um, that, that's why we have this kind of powerful belief in the intercession of the saints, but particularly of Mary, because, you know, Look like Jesus wasn't even going to do anything. And then she's like, come on. He's like, all right. So, you know, just like when I was a kid. If dad doesn't give you something, what do you ask? Mom. Oh, like, just, you know, <laughs> someone will say yes. That's how I got my ear pierced. You know, yeah. Not anymore. I asked my mom. She said no. But she, then she said, oh, just go ask your father. But no. And then my dad came home. He was like, it's your body. Do whatever you want. So got my ear pierced that day. My mom was not happy. But, you know. Anyway. Other things uh, stand out? Other questions? All right, well, if you have more or in the chat on Zoom, please uh, let us know as we go. Um, a lot of good stuff here in the Gospel of John. So because we're just jumping into John for a moment, and then we'll be back in Luke, a little reminder about the structure of the Gospel of John. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are called the synoptic Gospels. Synoptic kind of shares a root word with synonym, means same or similar. They're all about what Jesus did, and they speak about it from different perspectives. John is about who Jesus is. He's very em uh, overly emphasizing in very symbolic, very beautifully written prose, Jesus is the divine Son of God. That's what he wants to come across, to, to get across. So he doesn't bother with repeating things that have already been said by the previous guy. This is the last gospel written chronologically. He doesn't bother with repeating things unless they're relevant to the structure of the way he's presenting that argument that Jesus is the divine Son of God. Okay, So that if there is a similarity between John and the other Gospels, then it is very significant. It points to that divinity of Jesus. This is the first ministerial act of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And you'll kind of get a window into what John is trying to do here and why this is kind of unique and interesting. I said this is, only occurs in the Gospel of John, this particular story. But if you look at the first big ministerial acts in all of the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, it's the Sermon on the Mount. Okay, Jesus presents a new law on a mountain, contrasting the old law that was given to Moses on a mountain. Okay, Very Jewish imagery there, very particular kind of New Kingdom imagery there. In the Gospel of Mark, the very first act that Jesus does is an exorcism. Okay, and So you see kind of how Mark presents Jesus as this very powerful victor over evil and darkness. 
Luke, the very first thing that happens is Jesus' proclamation in the synagogue of the scripture, I think from Isaiah 60 or 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And then he says, today this scripture is fulfilled at your hearing. And he gets thrown out of his hometown for uttering what they believe to be blasphemy, but what he is sharing is truth. And so you see kind of the persecuted suffering servant of Jesus that Luke tries to present. John here, like we have the raising of Lazarus from the dead in John. So the question would be like, why are you starting with a wedding where it seems like Jesus isn't even trying to do anything? It's very interesting, the kind of structure that John is setting up here. So the structure of John goes like this. There's a prologue, an incredibly beautifully written prologue. If you read chapter one of Genesis next to the first section of uh, first chapter of John, you'll see exactly what he's trying to do here. He's painting like a new creation but showing the role that Jesus has in his ministry in that new creation of a new kingdom, contrasting it with similar language that is used in Genesis chapter 1. But So we have that prologue, and then we have, there's two main books or parts of the Gospel of John. And John chapter 2 to chapter 12 is called the Book of Signs. And in the Book of Signs, there are seven big, major, seven signs in John that Jesus performs to show that he is divine, that he has power over death, that he has power over the elements, that he is ushering in something new. Uh, and they all point to the second section of John, which is called the Book of Glory, which is John 13 to 20-ish. And that is all has to do with his kind of last moments um, on, on earth in, in Jerusalem and during the span of Holy Week. So the signs are all, the book of signs, and the signs in them are all pointing to glory, to the book of glory, okay? And so this is the first sign in the book of signs of the seven signs that are in John, okay? With me so far? Okay, so we enter into John chapter 2, and we have my favorite phrase, on the third day. So what does that mean? We have to go back. So turn back to John chapter 1, verse 1 very beginning of John. What does it say? In the beginning, day one. Okay? In the beginning, on day one. Now turn to 1 verse 29. It says, the next day. Day two. Now to 1 verse 35. The next day, day three, verse 43, the next day, that's day four. And now we have chapter two, verse one, on the third day. So if you're doing your math, four plus three is seven, the divine day of rest, the day of completion. Okay, so if John, which is clearly doing in the beginning of this gospel, is creating kind of a new Genesis, creation happens in how many days in Genesis? Seven, seven and on the seventh day you rest. There's this kind of rest, this intimacy with God and his creation, this new thing that he has made. There's the uh, experience of love, intimacy, perfection, all of that rolled into that seventh day. Now, John is creating a literary device where he's putting you through the events of this, this first part of Jesus's ministry, but he's using that same language in the beginning, the next day, the next day, the next day, and then on the third day, three days later. We have this miracle. So on the seventh day, I love that. So cool. So easy to miss. And that's why John is so brilliant. The, the Gospel of John, I've mentioned this many times in other places, is literally like a literary miracle. Because I think it was C.S. Lewis who pointed out, there is no writing like the Gospel of John. It's prose. It's kind of narrative style. There's nothing like it ever before. And nothing like it shows up after until the first modern novel, which is Don Quixote by Miguel Cervantes, which was written in the early 1600s. So this is like crazily unique that it even exists in its complexity, in its literary style, in its beauty, in its, its symbolism. Nothing else like it anywhere around it for like a thousand years in both directions. Um, so, yeah. Would, would John have read the other three uh, Gospels? Yeah, he would have known them. Yeah, well, especially Matthew, because they were both apostles. Yeah, but he would have been aware of them. So I, when I have this book called the, um, a synopsis of all four gospels and it lays all four gospels like, um, in columns and you can see the exact like text. 
And you can tell who copied from who because it's exactly the same, even if it appears out of order in their gospel. So you have some of that exact text copying in the Gospel of John, but the least of it. John is the one who kind of tries to hyper-stylize all of it for his particular point of view, his argument that Jesus is the Son of God. But he would have been aware of the rest. And I think that's why he leaves certain things out purposefully, and then he adds things that others missed for that reason. So we've established this is on the seventh day. On the third day, this uh, third day imagery also relates to what happens immediately after this story. Jesus goes to Jerusalem that same day. Uh, it appears in the text, even though that would have been quite a long walk. Um, but it appears on the same day, and he throws over the, te the tables of the money changers, and they say, "What sign? What sign?" Can you show us for doing this? And he says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So he's establishing this three-day, third-day kind of motif to always come back to third day, third day. Jesus is divine. Jesus is risen from the dead. Jesus is the divine Son of God. That symbolism constantly coming into the text. So all of that in the first four words. So here we go. Um, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana. Okay, Wedding, as I said, lasted a week. Uh, ish and in Cana, Cana is near Nazareth, where Jesus grew up. It's about three, in, well, there's two places where they believe Cana might be. One everyone is pretty convinced of is the historical Cana. There's actually a church there called the Wedding Church at Cana. Um, that's three and a half miles northeast from Nazareth. The other place that's disputed is still just like nine miles away. So it's, it's just a day's walk um, for them. That's a pretty simple distance. Um, so very likely the people who were getting married, um, Jesus and his family knew them. I mean, it's a very small town linked to a neighboring small town. They probably would have done work there. Jesus and his father as carpenters, tecton, stonemasons, which is kind of a more accurate translation. They would have done work in that town. They uh, potentially were relatives. There was one tradition that said, um, what did I read? That, it, that this was actually the wedding of Jesus's brother, even though it doesn't mean brother, but one of the people who's listed as his brothers, because it means relatives, later in the gospel of John, um, another person named John, uh, who was a the son of a sister of Mary or a cousin of Mary. Uh, that's not in the text, but that was something that was um, circulated for some reason in the early church. So I don't know if it's true or not, but um, nonetheless, they probably knew them. And then it says, and the mother of Jesus was there. Mary is never named in this gospel. She's never called Mary in the Gospel of John. Just like John is never called John, he's called the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, so there's a lot of particular reasons why he does that. First of all, he calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, so that when you and I read it, we can just infer, well, I'm, I'm a disciple who Jesus loved. So I can place myself in the text much more easily that way. Um, it could also be for John's humility. He doesn't want to put himself in the text. He wants to highlight who Jesus is, not who he is. And also this uh, phrase from Mary, the mother of Jesus, points to later in this gospel where he gives Mary as the mother, uh, to the mother, he gives his mother to John to be the mother of him and the mother of all of us, uh, and asks him to take her into her home. And so that kind of motherly quality is what John wants to emphasize rather than kind of her human name or her human identity. He wants to emphasize the relationship and lastly, if you were caught in kind of Arab or Semitic culture of this time, and a lot of Arabic cultures today still, if you were to call someone the mother of someone else, it was, it's a, a, a phrase of blessing. It's a phrase of blessing upon that person to say, you've been blessed to be able to have children. So you are the mother of this person. It shows the blessing of family, the blessing of the woman to be able to bear that child. So it's considered like a nice title in, in essence. So all of that could be the reason why. Uh, her name is omitted. Verse 2, Jesus and his disciples, now we don't know how many of his disciples are here so far, because so far in this gospel, we've only had the calling of Philip and Nathaniel, who's also known as Bartholomew, um, and Simon Peter and Andrew. Um, and then there is another, gospel, uh, another disciple who's named Walking, well he's not named, but he's a disciple who's walking with Andrew originally, which many believe to be John who wrote this gospel. So there's only five disciples who've been kind of pointed out so far. So we don't know if all of the rest kind of are just inferred that they came around, or if it's just Jesus and the smaller group of his disciples that he's forming. But they were also invited to the wedding, which is interesting because this is kind of a ragtag group that Jesus didn't really know, and all of a sudden, all of them collectively as a group are invited to this wedding. 
So it implies that there's kind of a time gap here between the events of chapter one and the events of chapter two. Obviously, there would have been some kind of establishment of Jesus and his posse or his group, his disciples, having done something significant enough and gained enough of a following to be invited as a whole and to have enough of them have a relationship with whoever was getting married for them to invite the whole lot. So we don't know exactly why, but they're all invited to the wedding. Verse 3, when the wine ran short, again, a huge faux pas for a party like this. This would have been a huge embarrassment um, to the bride and the bridegroom, to their families. It would have been probably a bad omen about the type of marriage or family or relationship they were going to have. Um, maybe even be interpreted as a, design, a sign of disfavor from God upon their union. A sign that maybe they had sinned or entered into this union sinfully. Um, so that is a big deal. So the mother of Jesus says to him, they have no wine. They have no wine. She simply states the issue. And I think this is a really great example of how to pray. Because I don't know about you, but when I pray, I state the issue, and then I give my preferred desired solution to that issue that I would like God to deliver as soon as possible, right? Anyone else do that? Okay. But what Mary does is she just states the issue. And we see by her actions that she just expects and knows that Jesus will do something. She trusts. She doesn't have any questions about how it's going to happen. And I think she's learned that, right? Because in the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, the angel Gabriel comes to her and she says, well, how can this be? She has questions. I think she's learned now by 30 years later, like, I don't need to have any questions. I kind of get the picture now. He's going to do something. I kind of know that this guy's pretty special. So this is kind of, it's a good example for us on how to enter into prayer. Lord, here is what is in my life. Here's what's going on. I trust that you will do something. Not presenting solutions, not presenting ideas of how to like coach God on how to be God, but just to trust with humility that he knows best, that he has a plan, and that he's already working for it. But we simply are bringing him the things that um, are burdensome to us, and he delights in us bringing him things, just like I delight in my children bringing me things. Even if I already know what to do, or if I don't have any need of those particular things they give me, I still delight in them. And I still have a plan or an intention to take care of them and to be there for them regardless of that. So they have no wine. Verse four, and Jesus said to her, woman, how does your concern affect me? Ooh, that sounds bad. Huh? <laughs> you know, uh, it says in the footnote, first of all, that this was actually considered a polite title. Okay. So how we hear it is based on a lot of kind of um, cultural and like TV movie kind of and derisive gender type of language that we're used to kind of calling out now in modern culture, rightly so. Um, but in this context, this wouldn't have necessarily been interpreted as derisive. Um, however, I want to point you to another time where, and my wife said it, um, where woman is used, and that is in Genesis. Remember, John is painting a kind of new Genesis literary structure in the way he's writing his gospel. And if we look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 12, particularly after they have sinned, fallen into sin, God confronts them um, after being told that they were naked, God says in verse 11, God asked, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat? The man replied, the woman who you put here with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, so I ate it. Okay, so she actually is not named Eve until later um, in the gospel, until later in the account in verse 30. The man gave his wife the name Eve, which means life, because she was the mother of all the living. Okay, so she does not, she's not named until later. So her title is woman. And it probably derives somewhat from coming from man because she was created in this account from the rib or from the side of Adam. Um, and Adam doesn't, it wasn't any kind of proper name. It means um, creature of the earth because Adama means earth. So it's really earth creature and life. And then only after this kind of splitting and this complementarity of man and wife are they called man and wife, he and she, ish and isha in Hebrew. So anyway, um, Eve is the first woman, okay? And we've talked about this previously when uh, Mary was um, conceived without sin. Eve also was. Eve was conceived without sin, okay? Sin did not exist, okay? So Mary is kind of this archetypal new Eve. And one of the titles of Jesus is the new Adam. He's coming to do what Adam could not do, which is protect the garden and everything in it. That was the command of God to Adam. You have dominion over everything in the garden. Protect it. And that included himself and Eve, who was standing right next to him, and he did not do that. 
So sometimes historically you hear like the, the original sin was the fault of Eve. Well, Adam was standing right there, not doing his job either, not protecting Eve and not holding fast to the blessing and to the, the rules that the Lord had entrusted to them. Uh, so this title of a woman, I think, points back to Eve. And now we have this scenario here where we have the former Adam and Eve, both being presented with an opportunity to do the Lord's will and rejecting it, and that in some way being redeemed here in this, the symbolism of this historical event, presenting Jesus as a new Adam who's willing to say yes, even if it is difficult, and instead of the pressure from the woman to sin, it's the pressure from the woman to do good. And again, dealing with a fruit of a tree the first time, something pleasing to the eyes, desirable for gaining wisdom, as it says in, in Genesis 3. Here we have, again, the, uh, what is the word? The fruit of fruit, I guess. The wine coming from uh, the fruit of a grape. And so we have a very similar kind of structure that John is painting here, trying to really show something new is happening here. And these people, Jesus and Mary, Jesus in particular, are going to do something to redeem what went wrong the first time. The first time we lost original holiness and original sin entered into the world, and now sin is going to be destroyed and holiness will be restored through these particular people, through Mary's yes to bring Jesus into the world, and now Jesus' yes to enter into his public ministry and to begin these signs as a sign of his glory to come. Okay, so all of that at play here. Uh, woman, how does your concern affect me? This actually, um, some of you might have... Um, what to me and to you, or something like that in your translation. This is, was a common Semitic uh, phrase, and it had two different meanings. One was, um, what have I done to deserve this? <laughs> I think it's funny. And the second one is, what is my involvement in this? So in a sense, Jesus is saying here, like, look, like, this is not, I didn't come here to do this. I didn't come to help you know, at this wedding. I have a particular, like, my hour has not yet come. It's not time for me um, to be in my glory. So that's what he says next. My hour has not yet come. And that theme, that phrase will show up quite a bit in the Gospel of John, if you're reading and you pay attention. And underline it anytime you see it. My hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. And you'll keep seeing it until you reach John chapter 12, in verse 23, when Jesus has entered into Jerusalem in the final week of his life, and he's telling those among him that his hour is coming. And he says in verse 23, Jesus answered them, the hour has come. For the Son of Man to be glorified. And then he goes into the whole diatribe about whoever uh, loses his life will gain it, and whoever seeks to gain his life will lose it. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it can, bear for, uh, can bring no life, things like that. All this imagery to show that Jesus is going to die because his hour has finally come. So when he says, my hour has not yet come, he's referencing his ministry that he already knows is going to culminate in his death. And so in a sense, Jesus is saying here, look, like I don't want to call attention to myself yet, or I'm not ready to start yet, or there was a different way that this is going, or is this really going to be the way that this begins? Kind of showing her, like, we need to be careful about this. We need to be careful about this. There's a particular plan, a particular mission. Now, I don't know if that means that there was really any reserve on Jesus. I think it's more a point that John is making to show that Jesus had a particular mission. He had a particular mission, and he knew he had a particular mission that was going to culminate in his offering of himself on the cross. But, verse 5, his mother said to the servers, um, servers here, uh, the word is diakonos, it's where we get the word deacon. So the very first iteration of a deacon, we have deacons in our church, but the very first use of that word had to do with waiters serving tables. And that really has to do with their job. They're serving the table of the Eucharist, and they're serving the poor, providing food for them. That, those were their main two jobs specified in Scripture. It says to them, do whatever he tells you. She does not wait. She expects in faith that Jesus is going to act. And that is a great example for us in our prayer, in our everyday life. To not wait to present needs to Jesus, but then to let them go and let them be at his feet and not take them back and hold on to them and worry about them, but to leave them there and expect he's going to act. He's going to do something. He's going to fulfill his promises and be faithful as he always is. Verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for Jewish ceremonial washing. So we've talked about what these are and why they're significant, used for purification purposes. Um, but... Okay, how do I how do I start with this? So 
What this, what this story, I think, is really trying to communicate, we're talking about this good wine, this new wine, just like elsewhere in the Gospels, you cannot put new wine into old wineskins, that Jesus is the new and good wine. Jesus is the new and good wine. Wine, in order to be made, needs to be, grapes need to be crushed. And that reminds me of the Garden of Gethsemane at the end of Jesus' life, uh, or his earthly life, the night before he's going to be handed over, when he's going to be handed over, he's kneeling in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he begins to sweat blood out of anxiety and stress for what is going to happen. That's when he says, Lord, if it be your will, let may this cup pass from me, but thy will be done. And Gethsemane in Hebrew means the place of crushing. Actually, there's an oil press there, so it's where olives were crushed to make olive oil. And so Jesus here is kind of presented also as one who is being crushed and who will result in this new wine, this new covenant, this new relationship that people can have with God. The Jewish ceremonial jars, what do they represent? The old covenant, the old law, the old way, all the ways that they were supposed to be washed and do all these little rituals that became kind of like talismans or little kind of magic spells in a sense that like, okay, if I do this, I'll be okay. It's just like if you ever see, get those chain letters, those Catholic chain letters, like, okay, if you pray this novena for nine days, like, your, your biggest dreams will come true, but you have to forward it to, like, 18 people. Like, I do not think that, like, Jesus operates via spam. Like, I don't, I'm just, I'm just guessing, but, and I would, we would, you find them in the chapel, we'd find them at my old church all the time. There would be, like, dozens of them. People would put these miraculous novenas that just forward this to six people or whatever, and all of your wildest dreams will come true. Prayer is not a talisman. It's not like you can get whatever you want. That's not how it works. But a lot of these rituals in the Jewish culture had become that way. The sacrificial system, a lot of the traditions of the elders, these little ceremonial washings, that's how they treated them. And so here we have this representation. Jesus is bringing this old symbol of the whole old way of doing it. And he's presenting himself in a transformative capacity to bring something new from that. Thus he says in the Gospel of Matthew, like, I did not come to abolish the law, I came to fulfill it, to transform it. So these represent the old way. We talked about how much they have and how that's an insane amount. Um, verse 7, Jesus told them, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. To the brim. So representing in one sense, remember there's six of them, so six means incomplete. So they're representing the fullness of the Jewish covenant and all of their law, but also iterating that even at their fullness, they are still incomplete for the ways in which we need to be redeemed, the ways in which Adam and Eve fell, and new Adam and Eve need to come and reconcile us in a new relationship with God. All this complex symbolism. Verse 8, then he told them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. Now, the head waiter was the chief steward. We don't know if this was someone who was like a family member, kind of like, you know, oh, we're getting married, Uncle Jeff will DJ, you know, or if it was someone who was like a professional who was hired, we don't know, okay? Um, but typically at a wedding, there was someone who was like the MC, the master of ceremonies. They were the chief steward or the head waiter. They would taste the wine uh, every time it was served, and they would announce the blessing and a series of blessings over the couple and announce that next toast, uh, announce all these different events of that whole week of festivities. Uh, and so they take it to the head waiter. Now notice, there's no moment in here where it actually says where the water turns into wine. Doesn't say. So for all intents and purposes, these servers are bringing what could still look like water to this head waiter. I mean, I have no idea what this crazy person is doing. Okay, put it in these gross ceremonial washing bins, and I'm taking this to the head. Like, no way. No, no guarantee that this is what was going to happen. There's no assurance here from what we can see in the text. But it just says, so they took it. And verse 9, and when the head waiter tasted the water that had to become wine, we only see it then that it changes. It's the only place where it's references that the change happens after he tastes it. But sometime before that, it had changed. Without knowing where it came from, although the servers who drew the water knew, they, they knew that it had come from these jars, calls the bridegroom. Okay, so the bridegroom is the groom, okay, bridegroom and the bride. And he says to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then when people have drunk freely, an inferior one. But you have kept the good wine until now. We already established this was common, uh, this was practice, so that you could save some money, you could keep people happy, um, but, you know, save some, some money there. Um, but you have kept the good wine until now. The good wine, this new covenant, this new law, finally coming to fruition in Jesus Verse 11, Jesus did this as the beginning 
of his signs. Okay, so John established this as the beginning, and they continue to progress from there. The second sign happens in chapter 4, and it's back in Cana, where Jesus heals an official son. Okay, and then we have other signs like um, a multiplication of loaves is one. The last one is the raising of Lazarus from the dead. They kind of get more and more complex, more supernatural, more impressive as they go. Um, Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs in Cana and Galilee, and so revealed his glory. Okay, that was referenced when I said, my hour has come in John 12. That's referenced uh, in the way that John is organized, the book of signs and the book of glory. And it's referenced at the very beginning of the Gospel of John in, chapter, in the prologue, in chapter 1, verse 14. It says, and the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The Hebrew word for glory is kavod. And in uh, the Old Testament, it's almost always and entirely used for God the Father. And so simply using this word in association with Jesus is showing that John is arguing that he has divinity that is similar to God the Father, if not the same. Okay? So this is a, a very um, important association that John is making here. And his disciples began to believe in him. They just called them. So there is probably some span of time here. And they're responding to this call that a rabbi finally wants to take me uh, under his wing to be his disciple. I was rejected from the synagogue. I'm a fisherman. And finally someone says I'm good enough. But whoa, this guy actually is who he says he is. And they begin to believe. So it's not only a sign for all of us, for the people that this is happening for, but it's a sign for them. It's interesting that the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry has to do with this wedding and wine. And the very last speech he gives on, at the Last Supper uh, he also mentions wine. It's his last I am statement where he says, I am the vine, the true vine in chapter 15. This kind of fruitful imagery. It's also interesting that this is a wedding because we have that coupling wedding imagery at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis, the first three chapters, and we have it at the very end in Revelation. At the end of time, Revelation 19 and verse 6, then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of rushing water or mighty peals of thunder as they said, Alleluia. The Lord has established his reign, God the Almighty. Let us rejoice and be glad and, glad and give him glory. For the wedding day of the Lamb has come. His bride, which is the church, has made herself ready. So the wedding is this image that is all throughout Scripture as the archetype for the intimacy that God wants to have with us, the unity that he wants to have with us, the covenant, a giving of two people to one another. That's the image of the relationship we're meant to have with God. And it's imaged most perfectly here on earth in a wedding. And all of that is happening here in the context of this passage. These signs, signs also accompanied covenants all throughout the Old Testament. Like the covenant with Adam and Eve was the sign of creation. The covenant with Noah was the sign of the rainbow after the flood. The covenant with Abraham was the sign of circumcision. The covenant with Moses was the actual presence of God coming down on Sinai and giving the law. The covenant with David was his kingdom and eventually the building of the temple. <coughs> Even his uh, relationship, um, an informal covenant, it may be, with Elijah was evidenced, signed by fire coming down from heaven and consuming the altar of sacrifice when he is competing against the prophets of Baal. All of these things God was kind of leading up to in the Old Testament, establishing the sense that like a sign points to something beyond it. Okay, and so all these signs that Jesus is doing are all evidence in John's eyes of his glory, and it culminates in the most glorious offering of Jesus' self on the cross that he's fully in control of, fully offers himself, and then he rises from the dead, fully in control of his humanity and his divinity, defeats death and darkness, and shows definitively his glory, redeeming what Adam and Eve lost. Adam, born without, without the ability to die, leaves that behind for the darkness of sin, and now humanity dies. Jesus is the opposite. He comes and enters into human likeness, submits himself to death, and is resurrected to a form that can no longer die. So you see all this reversal, this beautiful imagery that John does to show us that Jesus is intentionally coming to redeem us, intentionally coming, as he says in the very first verses of the Gospel of John, all things came to be through him, and without him nothing came to be. What came to be through him was life, and this life was the light of the human race. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And what event is more you know, beneficial, a better example to show light in the midst of darkness? 
Now, a wedding, even in the midst of COVID, when COVID was at its like highest level of panic and quarantine, there were still people getting married because they couldn't wait. And you would see these things being live streamed and how happy they were. And yes, they were disappointed that they couldn't be what they, but they just couldn't wait anymore. I mean, I had so many live stream invitations for weddings, like probably more actual invites that way than I had to real wedding invites in my life so far. Like it was insane because that light shines in the darkness. And that's why I think it's such a beautiful image that John uses, a very unusual image, but John uses to start the, the ministry of Jesus um, to show that he is redeeming what was lost in that original marital union between Adam and Eve and humanity and God. And they are restoring it here in this moment. Any questions or other thoughts? Isn't it beautiful? Just such beautiful, like so beautifully written. All that symbolism, like if you understood. Yeah, it's incredible. John is just, it's a miracle that John exists in this capacity. Like the prologue of, people have studied it, even non-Christians have studied the prologue of John because of its just theological, philosophical, and literary complexity. And so like, I, I encourage you, sit down and like maybe with Genesis 1, uh, 1 from 1 to maybe 30, and then uh, the first 14 verses of John and just read them side by side and see just the brilliance of what he's doing there, you know, and then reading about God resting and then the fall in Genesis three, and then reading this story and seeing how God restores all of that and brings it together. It's such as a literary triumph that John is doing here. It's incredible. And then that's just the beginning. This is the first sign of seven more to come. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, it's good stuff. All right, let's pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for just the beauty of this gift of your word, and how um, tonight being such a great reminder that we can never exhaust the depth and complexity of your word, that we can come back to something time and time and time again, and there is always more to peel back always more to be revealed about how much you love us, how intentional your plan for us was to bring us back into right relationship with you and redeem what was lost, what has been broken, what has been wounded in us by sin. So I pray, God, that when we hear this gospel proclaimed this Sunday, that we wouldn't just hear the story we've heard many times, but we would hear an intentional plan at work being put forth by you through the intercession and um, encouragement of your mother reminding us how to pray, how to come to you, that you are enacting this plan for our redemption, for our unity and intimacy with you. And that's what you're doing each and every day. Anytime sin enters into our life, anytime suffering or trial, you are constantly using it to work for our greatest possible good. So we thank you, Lord, for the gift of your plan for our lives, for the lives of everyone on this planet, and that you are constantly working toward our redemption and relationship with you. So we pray, God, that we would respond to that gift of love and life each and every day and how we live and how we share this with others. Help us to be immersed in Scripture every single day, and especially to sit with this passage this week and just reflect on, on the beauty and complexity of it, and that it was all done for us. Not just us collectively, but us individually. That's how much you love us. We pray all of these things in your most precious name, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.